Today on Inspiration Plus, we have a phenomenal woman, an ardent supporter of diversity and inclusion, a humanitarian at heart with a strong passion for social justice. She is none other than Fadzi Wande, a natural storyteller who has the ability to engage and captivate her audience. She is a strategist, keynote speaker, trainer, facilitator, mentor, consultant, and activist. Currently working as the manager of inclusion and diversity at the University of Western Australia. She is an Australia Day ambassador for Western Australia and also an ambassador for the philanthropic women's cycle, 100 Women, Water for Africa, and the humanitarian group. Fadzi sits on several boards and is the founding director of the One Day Group, a premier diversity consultancy and program development organization. She is a relentless and passionate woman who has been recognized locally and internationally for her ongoing efforts to encourage, promote, and advocate social justice. Coming up, Fadzi reveals to us her key driving force for the work she does and she also speaks about how she managed to turn your sadness and pain to strength and victory. In time, it's about being true to you know your calling and your purpose and I feel like uh, God has called me to really empower and encourage women. Her insight into her beautiful ashy story is the one not to be missed. The story of overcoming is a story of allowing God to take you through what you could consider the most harshest, you know, situation. Stay tuned for some inspirational and insightful words from Fadzi. incredible and inspiring woman you are Fazi. where do you find time to do all these things you do i think you know when you've been equipped and and called and there's a purpose on your life um it's not so much about finding time it's about being true to you know your calling and your purpose and i feel like uh, god has called me to really empower and encourage women and mm -hmm. so um, I guess when I get opportunities to do all of that, um, it, it, it comes with no hesitation on my part. In fact, I feel like all the other stuff um, become less of a priority. And, you know, um, one of the verses that I love in the Bible, um, you know, really talks about how he, he strengthens you when in times of weakness. Amen. Not only that, Amen. but it also, you know, one of the things that has always inspired me is that when I feel like I'm not able to do anything, that's the perfect time to allow him to come in and strengthen you and equip you to go forward. So really, the time is God finds the time for me and he also strengthens me to be able to accomplish the things that I, I, I feel that I'm called to do. Wow, wow. I know you are a woman of faith. You have so much um, faith in, in God and you believe that God has called you to do the work that you are doing. But I would like to also know, and I'm sure our audience would also want to know, whether there's any other key driving force that's driving you to do all these things that you're doing? I think in terms of uh, like work and skills, obviously you have to have a passion for the things that you're doing, right? You, you know, there's no point in me um, being passionate about something that one, I don't have the skills for. So I think it's also important to make mm -hmm. sure that if there's something that you are passionate about in terms of work, that you go out of your way to acquire those skills um, and enable yourself. You know, I always think that, you know, um, we have to work with excellence. Mm -hmm. And working mm -hmm. with excellence means that you have to make sure that you know as much as you can and also be teachable, have a teachable spirit, 
um, and be willing to learn. And so, yes, I, did I go to university? I did. But, you know, the thing that I went to university for, I got a master in business administration. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mm -hmm. exactly say that that's the field that I'm working in, but there's aspects that I learned in the course that has, have enabled me. So, you know, starting the one day group, all of those things have been a learning. But I think my passion and the things that I've always been attracted to, um, I find that the jobs that I have will always, I, I guide them. So I might be, you know, called one thing, but somehow the passions yes. will always guide me towards that, which is, I think, why I sort of got involved in the diversity and inclusion space. Wow, wow. Wonderful and beautiful um, way of putting it. Let me take you back to a time when you were a child. Let's talk about the things that you used to do as a child. Have you always known you were going to be a champion of social justice or there were circumstances in your life that propelled you to become one? So when I was six years old, um, I had a nightmare and I woke up and my father, he's a journalist, was actually watching the, the news at the time. And the report was about a plane crash and there were all these people um, and I remember waking up and seeing this and I asked him what was happening. And there were these um, just different people mm -hmm. that had jackets on. And I remember looking at it and I said, what is UN? And, you know, he laughed and he was like, that's not UN, it's the UN. And I was like, what is the UN? Wow. And he said, well, it's this organization that helps people, mm -hmm. you know, and um, they always get people all over the world to go in anytime there's been a problem. So uh, what we're seeing now is that they're looking for survivors. There's been a plane crash. And I said, it's an organization. You work for them. And he said, some people work for them. Others are volunteers. Mm -hmm. So he was just telling me that in this case, he thought that a lot of them were volunteers who were called to help. And I said to him, I want to do that when I grow up. I want to be somebody that somebody, whoever this UN place yes. could call and I could go in and help. Wow. So that is the earliest memory I have of actually wanting to make a difference. And to be quite honest, everything that I have done, that has always been at the back of my mind. So I can say that, that um, I've always known that I would probably be working in an environment where I would be helping people mm -hmm. is somehow because mm -hmm. that's what drove me. So I guess, you know, I think we all have the, the crucible moment. That's right. For me, that was my crucible moment. And so everything that I have done from that point has always been helping people. I started volunteering when I was really young as well. Wow. So when, when I started high school, I was, um, you know, part of the Interact, Rotaract. And then when I left school, I actually volunteered for Samaritans. And Zimbabwe, Samaritans is like what Lifeline is in Australia. So a 24-hour uh, telephone service mainly uh, started for suicidal and depressed people. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that. I was doing shifts there when I was 18, 19, wow. you know, wow. getting calls. And so um, nobody knew about it because we weren't really allowed to tell people that's what we're doing. So that, you know, uh, at, at that time, I guess there was... Uh, there was a danger that people would know and I never wanted people to you know be uncomfortable and I would actually get calls from people that I knew but we never gave our names we gave a number so I think um, just knowing that and knowing how that has impacted a few people mm -hmm. is probably what's kept me wanting to always make a difference or help people perfect perfect you know, I've had the privilege and honor to read your story in Beyond the Scar, a book where about 10 women provide an account on how they overcame adversity. So that's the book that I'm holding right now. What a powerful and amazing, moving and confronting book. I know initially you were a bit reluctant about sharing your story. What made you change your mind? I think I'll, I'll sort of take you back a little bit mm -hmm. um, to, to you know, how that came about, because yeah. I think you'll probably understand yeah. the reluctance. Yeah. So I think um, I, at, at a certain point, I used to just share aspects of my story with different people. Um, and that was mainly because of 
either the reactions or I'd find that people would start crying and then I'm sort of counseling them and you know and one thing I couldn't make people understand is that the the strength or the resolve they were seeing was actually genuine mm. because I mm. came to know God when I was 11 years old so you know um, without giving too much of the story That's away right. yes. I think I write about you know the sexual abuse yes. when I was little and then overcoming that so God came into my life at a very pivotal time mm. and mm. it was at a time when I was really calling out for yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah. and he came so from the age of 11 I started this relationship with him and I had no Nobody else but God. So I think with the story, when I would talk to people about, you know, aspects of the story, mm -hmm. whether it was the relationship breakdown, I would find that, you know, when I would recount some of the things I'd gone through, mm -hmm. it would move them to tears. And then I'm sort of counseling them. So my reluctance in telling the story is I felt that, you know, a chapter um, or, you know, a few pages, mm -hmm. you don't actually have an opportunity to, to, you know, to really tell the story and yes. put it into scope. Yes. Yes. And also, um, before that, I felt that I was telling a story. Uh, it wasn't necessarily my story. So the people that were sort of highlighted were the people that I felt had done me harm. Mm -hmm. And my story, up until the time I wrote the book, was shrouded in bitterness. You know, bitterness towards yes. what had happened to yes. me. And I felt I didn't want the sting of bitterness mm -hmm. to be the story. Mm -hmm. And so um, I actually participated in a boot camp that was led by this phenomenal international speaker in Sydney called Sam Cawthorn. And um, I went through that for three days. And I actually realized at that stage that I didn't have any bitterness anymore towards, you know, the people or even just the fact that I'd gone through. Mm -hmm. And I realized that mm -hmm. everything that I have managed to achieve, the opportunities that God has given me would not have happened had I not gone through that. So then my story became, wow, you know, yes, I might have experienced yes. bad things, yes. but actually it's because of these things that I am the person that I am. So it was with the position of gratitude. And then I knew I was ready to tell the story because now it is my story yes. and it's a story yes. of overcoming. Mm -hmm. It's a story of allowing God to take you through what you could consider the most harshest, you know, situations and, and I was comfortable because I was telling the story, not so much um, because of, you know, making myself feel mm -hmm. good, but mm -hmm. over the course of my life, I met various people who had experienced similar things. And I think that, um, you know, having conversations with some of the authors and the person who put this book together, I realized that as women, some as, you know, majority of the women who wrote the book are Christians. Mm. We have a responsibility to boast of God's goodness. That's right. Because, That's right. you know, if we allow ourselves to think that everything that happens is negative, mm. what we're basically mm. saying is God doesn't know what he's doing. Right. But if God tells you that no temptation... Mm has taken you but mm. that which is common to yes, man and when yes. you are tempted he actually will provide you with a way out That's or right. when you read That's a verse right. that tells you that when you are weak he is strong mm. then mm. the only thing you can do is say god you obviously allowed it you might not have wanted this to happen but you were there and if i believe that then it means that i have to tell the story knowing that all the glory goes to God. Right. And so that That's was right. why I felt I was now ready to mm. tell the story mm. because mm. it was really a story of, you know what? Yeah, you know, life happens to all of us. Yes. You know, yes. sometimes we don't get the things that we want That's in the right. way we want That's them right. to. But God is still God. Yes. He's still on yes. the throne. Yes. And even in the most uh, dire circumstances and situations, the beauty comes out. Right. And so I felt that I was now ready. I was ready to tell the story that people wouldn't focus on the abuse but they focus on the goodness of yes, God. And yes. I think that's that's really um, the, the story that I want people to mm -hmm. take away. Mm -hmm. Not so much what happened to me, but about the power of restoration, yes. the power of forgiveness, yes. and yes. the fact that God is faithful mm -hmm. and he loves us mm -hmm. just the way we are. Wow, wow, wow. Beautiful. And you've really well said, you all said. And because when I look at the story, when I read it for the first time, I was in tears because of what God has allowed you to become as a result. So you have, and you might think that it is just about you sharing your story, like, but I believe that this is about you releasing yourself to the world 
and impacting people through your story and also becoming that evidence that there is power in what God has put in your life. Whatever God has put in your life, there is power and God will make sure that no matter what happens along the way, it will surely come to pass. And I look at your life right now. I look at myself now and I count myself blessed to be having this conversation with you because you have turned out to be an amazing, a phenomenal woman who is doing great things in the community. And maybe if you hadn't gone through what you um, went through, the story wouldn't be the impact this, your story was going to make was not going to be as strong as it is right now. I certainly believe that. And mm -hmm. I was also believe that, you know, culturally, yes. there's certain things yes. that we don't yes. talk about. Yes. And, true. you know, for a long period of time, mm. there's the element of shame, of guilt, of should I? Very true. But, you know, um, the Bible also tells us that we defeat the enemy mm. by the word of our testimony, That's right? right? The That's blood right. of the Lamb and yes. the testimony. Yes. Now, if we're not testifying, and if people don't see, then anybody who's experiencing that mm -hmm. will feel they are alone, which is exactly how I felt. Yes. I felt like, oh my God, I can't share mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's only me. I'm the only person going yes. through it. Yes. But when you start reading and when people are able to say, oh my God, Fadzi went through this yes. or she went yes. through that. Yes. And this is what God um, did for her. Mm -hmm. I feel that it mm -hmm. inspires and encourages people to, right. to know that it will be okay. Right. Right. And that was one of the reasons that I decided to to share my story was because i wanted people to know that they're not alone That's because right. you know the the good thing about a book is it reaches people yes. that you might never meet Very true. you might never have Very true. A, a, a conversation with mm -hmm. you don't know where they are and it's gone so far and wide you know in the hands of people yes. some of them yes. i might never know That's but at right. least the story and god's goodness is going so i feel like in a way it's also a tool where we can evangelize and we can tell about God's goodness. And it's something that I'm not ashamed of, you know. And so if you're not ashamed of something, then why wouldn't you want to shout it on the rooftops, That's you know? Right. That's um, right. So That's it, right. that is my way. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. And I know we you've really talked about the reason why you wrote the book and we've talked about, we, you know, you explained yourself. But I want us to get into the story and I know you touched on very important elements there um, in terms of the things that you had to do to help you recover. So do you mind highlighting some of those things to our audience? I think... For such a long time, I was very insecure mm -hmm. and I was looking for people to validate my worth. And number one, I think that the first thing we have to understand as, as people um, is that if we don't love ourselves, if we don't find validation within ourselves, nobody will ever be able to validate you. So the first thing I had to do was I had to love myself flaws and all. I had to realize, hey, I'm not perfect. And sometimes forgiving ourselves is the hardest thing. So I had to forgive myself for all the things that I felt, you know, the expectations that I put on myself, you know, to accomplish and be this perfect, a perfect person that actually doesn't exist. So I think forgiveness is one. You can't forgive yourself until you love yourself. And I think that's the, that's the key. And that's one of the things that I talk about also in the book in terms of, you know, not seeking validation from people. The other thing is about letting bitterness go. You know, bitterness is, is a cancer that just eats you up in terms of, you know, we, we are all human beings. We all make mistakes. Some, some mistakes are, are terrible and can be catastrophic. But the reality is that I had to come to a place where I was like, you know what? Um, I'm responsible for my own actions, for my own beliefs. I cannot change another human being mm -hmm. um, and, and only God can. And so I think that that was key for me in terms of, you know, uh, because a lot of the times we carry so much bitterness yes. Yes. and unforgiveness yes. towards people. And mm -hmm. I think that that really, does, it, it almost stops God from That's being true. able to move in, in, in your life. And I think that regardless of whether you're a believer or you're not a believer, holding on to that, um, you just need to let it go because it's like a weight that's, that lifts. And I talk about that. Um, but the thing for me is that my faith is so key 
to everything in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's also about putting God in his rightful place. And so all the other things in terms of, you know, loving yourself and all, I think the element for me was just, uh, it started with, um, realizing that my expectations mm -hmm. should only come from him yes. you know god is the only one that i should be expecting because he's the yes. only one who doesn't disappoint yes you know Amen. children Amen. disappoint <laughs> husbands disappoint sisters yes. parents all yes. of these people disappoint yes. but god never disappoints us and so once i realized that um i think it was easier but if there was a takeaway um that I would leave, um, you know, without going through everything in the book, I would say, first of all, you have to learn to love yourself. You have mm -hmm. to learn to forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to find worth in who you are as a person. Yes. Nobody can add that to you, yes. you know. And, and isn't it funny that as women, we go through this whole notion of, I want to get married. Yes. You know, I'm yes. half a lemon and then I will meet the other half mm -hmm. and then we'll become That's this right. beautiful, yeah. bittersweet. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. work like that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not whole within yourself, nobody can make you whole right so i think that's key yes. and the bitterness has to go yes. bitterness and unforgiveness yes. yes. are just weights that just keep you in bondage that's it's right. like you're in that's prison right. so that's i right. was you know carrying prison yes. and bondage yes. for so many years and when i actually released it you know i i can't even keep track with just the opportunities mm -hmm. and the elevation mm -hmm. that has come mm -hmm. but now my expectation is in god it's not in the work that i do it's not even in the invitations i might get yes. it's just like god where do you want me to go That's next right. what That's do you right. want me to do yes. and how can i use whatever platform to glorify your name wow. and that's what it's about wow. for me wow wow good people i cannot say enough about this book all I can say is grab yourself a copy and hear it, read about it, read all the stories that are in this book. It's an amazing book. It's a book that many of you are going to find freedom from and you're going to be liberated and you will be able to walk and live life without any garbage that you might have been carrying all along. So please, if you want to know where to find this book, um, feel free to leave a comment, um, send me an email. Um, Fadzi will also provide her details um, in order for you to get your own copy. I cannot emphasize on the importance <laughs> of this, the importance of you guys reading this book. Please get your own copy and it's available on amazon as well it, oh there yeah. you go it's available <laughs> on amazon there you go um so let's switch um from you know the book mm -hmm. to the company that you founded one day group what is the main reason why you decided to start your own company i feel that you know after the book I was really comfortable in who I was as a person. Mm -hmm. And the One Day Group is my way of really honoring and respecting the people that have gone before me. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way of honoring my identity. It's a way of uh, basically being comfortable now mm -hmm. and saying, you know mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. this is who I am. And I come from a legacy of phenomenal people. Mm -hmm. The One Day Group for me was an opportunity mm -hmm. to pay mm -hmm. homage to you know the legacy and the family that I come from. My grandfather had um, 10 children, two died when they were young, but my dad is one of two boys mm -hmm. and he had six daughters. So, you know, just seeing the, the, the strength that my aunties carry and the fact that they were brought up knowing that they could be anything. There was never a question of because they're female that they couldn't accomplish anything. So I think it was that and also the fact that I had reclaimed my name, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I was really comfortable um, with who I was. Mm -hmm. And One Day Group for me was, um, it came out of a period of unemployment. You know, I had, gone, I had gotten an MBA from, you know, the University of Western Australia. I had represented Australia, you know, at the UN, all of these things, you know. And I couldn't get a, a, I couldn't get a job. And I was really frustrated. But I think it was also God's way of showing me that your expectation and that validation that I was talking about earlier um, was like you're trying to get validation mm -hmm. from all of these things. Mm -hmm. Yes, you went there, you got this and all, but that's all seeking validation mm -hmm. from someone, but it's me. And so I thought, you know what? What do I have in my hands? What is it that I have 
and um, I have I have my name, I have the things that I'm passionate about, and so I started it, and it was very terrifying because I'm thinking, how am I going to pay bills? What am I going to do? But you know what? I just started with what I had, and um, you know, opportunities started coming my way. To be honest, I really I never really marketed my myself. It was you know word of mouth, and I started working with some really big companies. Yeah, uh, in terms of you know the work that I was doing here, as well as uh, overseas, and so yeah, that's one day group. And you are very authentic in your experience when you share your experience, and then when you share the things that you have gone through, even what contributed to you starting one day group. It wasn't out of um, a situation where you had all the resources you needed. You even though you had traveled all over the world, you had. Um, graduated with an MBA from one of the top universities in Australia, you found yourself in a place where you had to rediscover yourself. And many of our audience who are listening or watching this um, recording, I'm sure a lot of them can resonate with Wanda's, you know, with Fazi story where you are in a place where you're trying to start something and you don't know where to start but my encouragement to you like what Fancy said look at what you have don't look at what you do not have start from a place where you look at what you have and work with that no matter how little or small it is just start with what you have so thank you very much Fazi, for that and um what i would like to know as we're coming to a close from you is what are the three things that you're most grateful of i would have to say um my faith would be number one because i don't think i would ever survive without it um so i thank god that he found me when he did Secondly, I thank him for the friends and family that have been around me. You know, just in my time in Perth, um, I have one particular friend who's been with me since the very, very beginning and is still there, hasn't changed. You know, we're in two different kind of sectors, but is, is my champion. And, um, you know, throughout the course of my life, I have everywhere I've lived, God has um, provided you know, that kind of support. So I'm also grateful for, for them. And I'm also grateful for the children, and the two sons that he has really given me because it's uh, probably they're my driving force. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at them and I, I'm constantly reminded at possibility, I'm constantly reminded at what hope and um, just the goodness of God in that. And so when I see what God is doing, um, you know, for them in their own individual journey, I am grateful. I'm grateful that I have everything that I need to thrive, to survive in, in this in this world. And I think those are the three things that I would, um, you know, be, be grateful for. And I would also go a step further into, you know, challenging people to look at you know, what's in their world. Because sometimes we think that, you know, it's never about material mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And and you'll see just from my three things, there's mm -hmm. nothing that's material there. Yeah, actually. You don't actually need money or all of this stuff to actually, what's in your hand, if you use what's in your hand, and I think are grateful for the things that are around you, that is a motivation for you to be able to achieve and get the things that you want. And so for me, I think a lot of my identity, a lot of my passions, a lot of uh, my cheerleaders would come from the friends and family, and, and, and in particular, my sons. And I say that because, you know, as a single parent, raising boys, not even, you know, a girl, but raising boys, in this time can be very challenging. So they keep me grounded. Because when I go home, I'm mom. You know, I'm not fuzzy who's spoken here or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just mom. Yes. And when they're going through their situations, yes. they need mom. Yeah. They don't need the fuzzy that people That's read right. about. That's they right. just need me. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for them because they keep me grounded mm -hmm. and remind me what life is actually all about. It's not about these headlines and all of that. That isn't, it's about, you know, am I teaching them? You know, am I, you know, providing an environment for them to grow up knowing who God is yes. and making sure God is first. So that is what I'm thankful for. Wow. Wow. Amazing. You know, Fadzi, you're an amazing and impressive woman. I consider myself blessed to have had this opportunity to sit down with you and partake of your beautiful ashes, phenomenal life. Thank you very much for your time. 
Thank you very much for your time, Yemu, and um, I wish you all the well. I wish you the best in you know this journey. I know that it hasn't been easy for you, um, but you know if I may, I would also like to say to you that I think this is great, and I think what you're doing is you're providing uh, the audience um, as well as some young girls out there just uh, an opportunity to see themselves in the things that you're doing. So thank you, um, and thank you for um, honoring me, actually, by interviewing me. I am grateful, so thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.